So our next uh, speaker is Marzea Gassemi. Marzea is currently an associate professor at the University of Toronto, but soon she will be a faculty member in the electrical engineering, uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT and an in Institute for Medical Engineering and Sciences. Please, uh, Marzea. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to meet you. I'm just going to share my screen here. And then present. Great. So my name is Marcia Gassimi, and uh, I'm currently at University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. But as Colin said, I'll be moving this summer. And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how we explore healthy models in machine learning for health. Um, and really try to understand if AI can be used to make things fairer than maybe they currently are. So the reason that we're talking so much about machine learning, you know, now is not that it's new. We've had machine learning in medicine for a really long time. And when I say machine learning, I mean algorithms writ broad, right? We've had uh, thresholds and rule lists and checklists. And really now the reason we're having these more uh, nuanced discussions is we have state-of-the-art methods that are performing at or above humans that might do these tasks. And so through the human lifespan, we're now in a situation where instead of having a calculator or a checklist that occasionally you look at and if it's biased, it's not a big deal, we're having models that perform as well as or better than the humans who might perform. But uh, there's also been you know, some recent uh, questions about uh, what's in those boxes, right? So there's been a lot of concern recently, and these are just a, a couple of the articles that I screenshotted when I did a quick Google search a couple days ago. People are worried about what's in these algorithms that are performing at state of the art, right? If there's no longer a simple calculator that I can dismiss, I'd like to understand it. And really the, the sort of um, interesting thing is people want to trust AI. They want to be able to trust these models that we're running. Um, so I'm going to argue that you don't really need to trust the models, just the, you don't need to trust every human you interact with or every expert or every system. You need to be able to maybe have some understanding of the process and create actionable insights in human health using machine learning. So I'm going to focus on one part of my research agenda about what healthcare is healthy uh, and the first thing I'm going to start with is a recent direction of research for me. So I uh, have this big desire to make uh, machine learning fair, perhaps potentially in part by doing what Alex Madry has suggested previously, getting better data and getting more data and giving a large body of researchers that data so that we can learn models that work well for a broad group of individuals. Unfortunately, some people are really concerned about this, right? In a, you know, a private company setting for sure, but even if we're talking about uh, in an academic setting, they're saying, what about privacy in clinical prediction models? And the point is that anonymization is not a uh, completely robust system of removing patient information because you can, even with anonymization, potentially connect if you have other sources. And so one thing that's happened very recently in the past uh, couple of years is there's a state-of-the-art method that has come in and really been adopted by uh, many companies. So uh, Apple and Google use differential privacy, but also the US Census this last year used differential privacy to uh, guarantee uh, the privacy of respondents. And this is a technical system that guarantees the same level of privacy protection to all in individuals even if some of those individuals are very unique in the data set. And so if we have Sumana in a data set and for uh, her specific combination of gender, race, age, and zip code, she is very unique. Differential privacy guarantees that she will not be identified easily or even uh, you know, sort of uh, eventually given that an attacker is able to query our model or our systems. Now, differential privacy uh, hasn't been as well evaluated in a healthcare setting. And so I have a student who did a, an interesting experiment where there's a common task in uh, the MIMIC data set uh, that's made in, uh, in part by MIT and the local area hospital, uh, BIDMC. And so people often predict mortality. 
but they often predict it using this de-identified data without the uh, system of differential privacy. And so we said, what's going to happen if we add that, right? So normally what happens is year to year, you have models that are predicting uh, mortality. They're able to train on the data from all prior years. So I can, if I'm predicting in 2009, then I can use all data from 2002 to 2008. That's going to be what I train on. And now I test on all data in this new year. And differential privacy, if you look at this schematic, says that when I have some machine learning model, these are often trained with systems uh, that are coming from stochastic gradient descent, right? And so there's some amount of learning that happens where you see some data, you measure how well you are doing at predicting on that data, and then you propagate back the error that you've experienced to try to make your model better. And so here, what we do is we see how well we're doing, right? So we incur some loss you get a gradient and that's what you're going to propagate back to update your model. But differential privacy says that you have to noise and clip your gradients so that no one data point, remember uniqueness is we don't want anybody to be too unique and pull our gradient around too much so that they seem identifiable in the model output. So this noising and clipping is what guarantees privacy for these very unique individuals. But what we find is that when you use any level, even low levels of differential privacy, we see a huge drop. For example, the bolded pink line is what we get for logistic regression on this task year to year. And the bolded uh, blue line is what we get for logistic regression when we put differential privacy in. And you can see that there's this huge drop taking us down to a range where probably we wouldn't want to use the model. And we see that higher capacity models sometimes have even worse losses year to year. And even more concerning is when we look at what's happening within the data itself, what's happening is that training data is losing its predictive influence on the test when we have more privacy. That makes sense, right? Because data that's too unique it can't influence the decision boundary too much by design, right? And so it's losing, we're sort of clipping its influence, right? From being really, really helpful or harmful in classification to this sort of mid range. But what we found is that some patients lose more influence than others. And so specifically in our case, adding differential privacy changes the most helpful group training data from black patients to white patients in black test patients. And so what this means is that minorities are really who it looks unique when we're talking about health data. And so if we have minorities and minoritized groups, and they're the ones who are disproportionately getting noised and clipped in this very common differentially private stochastic gradient descent algorithm, that means that they are disproportionately unable to influence the outcome. And so this is a huge trade-off that maybe we don't want to make. And I'm, I'm making this point because uh, bias is already part of the clinical landscape, right? So it's not as if machine learning is out to get us. It's that when we're training on data that humans make, that humans label, that humans annotate, we might pick up some of the biases that humans have injected into that data. And so another thing that we've done recently is try to understand how much of that bias creeps into run-of-the-mill sort of vanilla applications of machine learning. And so, for example, we took three large chest x-ray data sets, so that's over 700,000 images. We trained a dense net to predict a no-finding label, meaning the model says the patient is healthy, okay? And then we're comparing the false positive rate in different subpopulations to examine model underdiagnosis rate. And I call it underdiagnosis because what's happening is if you have a false positive no finding, that means that there truly was a disease and you're saying as a model, no, there's nothing here, send the patient home. So a, high, a higher model under diagnosis rate in one subpopulation, like in female patients, would lead to a higher rate of no treatment in those patients if the model were deployed and listened to. So uh, what we found in this, again, very large uh, set of chest x-rays from three different sites in the United States is that there's the largest underdiagnosis rate in females, 
right, for this pulse positive rate. In those who are, if we look uh, by age, the youngest, zero to 20, black patients, and those on Medicaid insurance. And what's worse is that intersectional identities are often underdiagnosed by the model even more heavily than the aggregated group. So black or Hispanic female patients are underdiagnosed more than white female patients. And this is really troubling because as Irene was saying in the last talk, we know that we can sometimes audit models for fairness, right? So we can you know, sort of try to identify when they are uh, misperforming or underperforming for a specific ethnicity or maybe for a specific insurance type or a specific gender. But intersectional identities start to get really hard to do these audits in. And worse, sometimes it's unclear how imaginative you'd have to be to do an audit. And so we took a uh, large contextual word embedding model. So maybe you've heard of uh, BERT models or transformer models, right? That can generate uh, text that looks like human text. And we gave it a snippet here. Uh, this is from a real medical record where we just blanked out something. So a uh, blank race patient became belligerent and violent, sent to. If we say a Caucasian patient or a white patient was belligerent and violent, the cyber model, which is trained on PubMed abstracts, not on Reddit, not on news, on sci, you know, on scientific articles, says that these patients should go to the hospital. But the same model says that African, African American, or Black patients should go to prison. And these are the kinds of models that are currently being deployed, right, in chatbots, in predictive assistance, in um, automated, uh, you know, response uh, systems. And so a lot of these systems that we've shown work well enough maybe for dog detection in some settings, we're not really sure how to audit them robustly to make sure they work in healthcare settings without mimicking biases that may be so pernicious we don't even know how to check for them. One thing that I think we really have to embrace is we need to create more data. It needs to be diverse data because health research requires embodied data. And these robust, private, fair, high quality algorithms we're trying to train require large scale data sets for research use. I want to say as a quick aside, I have uh, another student who did this fantastic investigation into the impacts of using synthetic data, specifically when we're doing differentially private generative adversarial networks. They don't work well as a robust solution. So one thing I'm often told is why don't you just synthesize your data? Biased data sets we found can have disparate impacts on minority downstream classification influence, even when the real data set is not directly used, and even when the synthetic data set that is used for training imbalance, because the original imbalance influences the synthetic generation, influences the downstream task. And we found that supplementing or replacing data sets with synthetic data doesn't mitigate the fairness concerns that are caused by these existing biases. As Irene noted, there's no simple fix for ethical machine learning in health. This is an ongoing process that requires improvement at many stages of the pipeline and is going to require engagement on many levels by diverse teams. And so I think we need new tools to understand not just data, but also processes. We need to understand how we are acquiring data, what kind of teams we have, how we're defining outcomes, how we're building algorithms and how we're deploying them. So this work is in combination with a fantastic team of collaborators and students. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marzia. That was a great, great talk. Um, with a lot of striking examples as well. Um, again, we'll save all the questions uh, till the end. Thanks again.